So welcome uh, to the second day of uh, the conference mobilizing for the commons. Uh, 27th uh, meeting of cultural, European cultural magazines, 10th anniversary uh, conference on solidarity. We begin, um, we, we begin uh, today with uh, the session with uh, two thinkers uh, of, uh, that's, that try to rethink and understand both deep history of European integration and the future of the European project, regardless of its, con regardless and taking into account the, the current institutional setting. To my right, Ulrike Giro, who recently uh, wrote and writes and talks about Europe as a republic, bringing forward an idea of a future of Europe in a sense of a new beginning, let's say, even, uh, claiming that Europe is a woman and should be a woman. To my left, Marek Cichotsky, um, a political philosopher, uh, former, uh, formerly also advisor to the President of Poland and delegate of Poland to the uh, con European Constitution uh, Convention, who publi recently published a book on the problems of the political unity in Europe, uh, trying, trying to understand the, the, the roots and the transformation within Europe uh, of, of the notions of how to be together of the notions of common Europe. Um, and before I ask you first questions, we will organize the discussion so that I'll ask you for a short introduction, introductory remarks, and then we'll have a, a chat, let's say, as much as, as we can, uh, with a second part of the panel uh, devoted to your questions. Be prepared, have your, have your uh, comments and questions ready. I'll, I'll try to make a sh brief account, a brief picture, um, a, a briefly picture the, the state of the problem of solidarity as I see it, a very practical one, from this part of the world, the Central Europe, not only Poland. And as you know, in the midst of uh, the migration crisis, in the midst of refugee crisis, the, the governments of four countries that are today in the European Union, the, the so-called Visegrad countries, have uh, manifested uh, their det detachment from the idea of helping and admitting refugees as they come to Europe. Uh, they had legal reasons, they had political reasons, but in a symbolic sense, it, the governments of four countries, even the previous government in Poland, it's not just that it's the current government, initially declared as a... Um, a form of a, of a break with the idea that, to my mind, has held uh, Europe together, the idea of the principle of, of solidarity. So there was, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a break in the idea of solidarity coming from the countries that uh, integrated within Europe, reintegrated with, with Europe, because of the principle of solidarity. In a way, it was, to my mind again, the, um, a, a reckless uh, uh, dissolution of the very idea that helped to advance even national interests of the countries uh, of, of this region that uh, pursues solidarity on the grounds of European funds, structural funds flowing into the country, the solidarity around the energy union, helping to diversify the gas market, the, the electricity market, and to be less dependent on the, um, on the one source uh, that is often perceived as a threat, uh, the source from, from the east, the source of, of gas and, and oil, making uh, these countries politically dependent on Russia. And then, uh, remarkably, the, uh, there were many events happening at the same time. Uh, British uh, voters voted against uh, European solidarity, as you could interpret that. Happy to disagree with you. And they said also uh, they don't want to uh, be act on the principle of solidarity with migrants, the economic migrants from Central Eastern Europe. Uh, 
uh, Brexit campaign has been, among others, strongly directed against the, the migrants coming from this part of the world. As if seeing that it is a problem um, in the so-called Bratislava pro process, the, the leaders of the um, European Union countries met in middle of uh, September in Bratislava, and they declared they want to renew European Union. There were many claims and attempts uh, of, of leading the way in, in, in um, proposing a reform. No reform has been proposed, in fact. However, there was a, a, a slight attempt of a U-turn from, again, the central European governments, declaring the so-called uh, flexible solidarity, sort of coming back to the idea of flexible solidarity that the governments in, uh, regarding the refugee crisis will try uh, as much as they can, as much as can, they can afford in their capacity to act on the principle of solidarity and help the, the, the refugees. This was the outcome of September meeting uh, of the, uh, and declaration of the, of the Visegrad countries. Now my question to you, um, both of you, um, would be uh, what are, in your opinion, the, the main actors of solidarity in Europe? We cannot forget that there, are, there have been um, civil uh, citizens' activity, uh, refugee welcome protest uh, activity of people who went out to help refugees and migrants. The, the moral call from the societies have been there. It has been the solidarity principle um, uh, uh, action of, of um, civil society, both within Central Europe, Western Europe, all across the continent. But is it enough? Is, it, is that kind of moral call of solidarity enough? And uh, on the other side is the institutional arrangement in Europe as we know it today uh, and the institutions of solidarity that exist in Europe enough to keep Europe together, to, to keep it as a common um, European project. I would, uh, I would start from my left and then go to, to my right. Uh, Marek Cihonski, is, is, is the solidarity we have in Europe uh, it's institutional arrangement enough to keep Europe together? Um, thank you. Um, you have uh, already ruined my whole um, strategy for this discussion uh, because I hope not to be the first. Um, uh, and, uh, um, and, and, and why? Because, um, uh, because I have to confess that I have... Um, I am a little embarrassed with uh, with this discussion about uh, solidarity, especially if uh, this discussion takes place in this special place uh, we are uh, today. Uh, let's say uh, in the heart of the uh, Polish tradition of uh, of solidarity and thinking in uh, in terms of uh, of solidarity, um, uh, which uh, um, obviously Gdańsk is. And why I am embarrassed? Because I, I um, solidarity is a very, um, let's say, um, it's a term which uh, raises um, high ethical expectations, very high ethical expectations. And uh, uh, the, the, the question I, I would, uh, um, I would uh, uh, start with is rather um, uh, solidarity helps us to understand the current problem of the European integration, or rather it uh, makes it much more difficult to understand what is at the stake and what is the real uh, problem we have now. You uh, um, quoted this, uh, this, uh, this very popular narrative, uh, because I think that uh, we have, especially in times of crisis in the European Union, uh, to do with um, many narratives, political narratives, how to explain uh, the crisis, the financial crisis, the migration crisis, the geopolitical crisis. The problem with narratives is that all of them are 
uh, inten uh, with, with certain intentions. Uh, they are created not only to explain, just explain the roots of the crisis, but uh, uh, to, um, how shall I put it, to, exp to, to blame uh, 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 those who are more or uh, uh, responsible for the crisis and to show those who, are, who should be perceived as less uh, responsible uh, for the crisis, rather to show them as uh, responsible for solutions. So uh, narratives are, in, 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 in that sense, um, a tool to make politics. And, and I am a little bit embarrassed if we, if we, if we take such a uh, term as, uh, as solid, solidarity with all these ethical expectations as the argument uh, for creating these uh, narratives. And that is why I don't see um, this problem with uh, migration crisis and the position of the Central European countries not uh, so clearly as you have presented, uh, quoting this uh, narrative about the uh, lacking solidarity in solving the migration problem uh, here um, in the positions of the Central European uh, countries. I think it's, it's much more complicated. So my first point would be, uh, I'm not so sure whether it, this is a, a, a wise um, um, idea to start the discussion about the current situation in the European Union by using this uh, uh, term of, uh, of, of, of solidarity. Uh, what does it mean? I think um, for me, if we... Um, if we look at the current situation in the European Union, the most important uh, problem is not uh, the intensity of the integration, and this is probably the main difference between Ulrike and me, if I can foresee. Let's uh, see. But I know your text, so um, uh, I dare to... Um, to, to, to make such a, uh, 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 such a thesis, that this would be probably the main uh, difference between us, that I don't see the main problem of the European integration in the intensity of, uh, of, of integration. So, um, uh, for me, the main question is not uh, uh, whether the European institutions play a good role in the in European integration, should they have uh, more competences or less competence, and so on and so on. The main problem is the lack of balance. How to rebalance the European Union is the main challenge. Uh, uh, and maybe in that sense, we uh, have... Um, uh, we have um, uh, this uh, room for using uh, the term solidarity to understand better what uh, should this new rebalancing the European Union uh, mean. Uh, in a very general terms, I understand the European solidarity, if you want to use this term, as... Um, not to do something which is against the interests of our partners in the European Union. This is the basic meaning of the solidarity uh, uh, for, for me in the European Union. And just concluding uh, 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 this, this, this remarks, um, uh, I would like to directly answer your questions about uh, on on uh, uh, actors, the main actors. I will disappoint you probably, but uh, uh, I still believe we have, in fact, of course, many levels of activities in the European Union: uh, societies, uh, uh, civil organisations, regions, uh, uh, European institutions, uh, organisations. Uh, but still, the uh, most important uh, structure we have to our disposal to rationalise um, politics in the European Union, especially in the times of uh, poly crisis we have in the in, 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 in Europe, is uh, is is the stage, and and the core uh, uh, discussion about the future of the European Union is now not about the intensity 
of the European integration, but how to rebalance the Europe between these uh, key structures of uh, the rationalization of the politics as the states are. Okay, thank you. I think we will be coming back to some of the themes and, and claims you made. Um, but before we do, uh, Ulrike, my question to you, in reference to what Marek already said, but also in reference to your uh, rethinking of, of, of Europe, would be, uh, is, is the current, uh, again, institutional setting of Europe as we know it, mostly EU, but not only, I mean, Europe is not only EU, it's part in relationship to the countries that are not in the EU or doesn't want to be Britain uh, in the EU currently enough. And what, what is this narrative of solidarity all about? I just have to remind you that the, the uh, Mr. Juncker started this year with the opening text and declaration that solidarity has to be the main focus of the discussion. Our discussion here is not because he said that, but it is, in a way, the, the main topic of a European discussion this year. No, what, what, very what, shortly what, what, then. Very short. I, I don't think that Juncker is the best person to uh, personalize uh, solidarity in, 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 in Europe. <laughs> no, it, but he has, some, he has some influence to set the agenda for, uh, for the debate. Ulrike, please. <coughs> Yeah, Wojciech, uh, Marek, I'm very happy to be here in, in this really sort of historical um, building and place to talk about solidarity. I will answer you in um, five sort of bullets. The first bullet is that, um, you know, when you were quoting my book, Why Europe Needs to Become a Republic, the Republic comes after revolution, so the intention of the book was in one sentence to lift the cultural heritage of the French Revolution, which is Egalité, Liberté, Fraternité. Yeah? which is the sort of cultural heritage for everything that has been driving our thinking since ever then, which is uh, when all men are equal. Yeah? First point in the uh, declaration of um, uh, Universalité de l'Homme. Um, so if you take fraternité, which today you would translate with solidarity, yeah? sisternité, it's not gendered, red, yeah? but today you would say solidarity, then you have basically, when you say liberty, egalité, fraternité, you have the, um, the, the cross-ethnic bound or, or, or bondage here. Yeah? You can be solidarian, which is a non-ethnic concept. Huh? So that's the first bullet. The second is, if you, uh, and I will come back to this, the second bullet is that if you look Wikipedia and you Google uh, solidarity, what I did this morning, yeah, it's quite funny because it gives you a very, very evasive definition. Huh? It basically says, I try to recall, solidarity is a unity based on, uh, of a group based on shared principle, interests and values. And then it goes on and uh, some differentiation about Durkheim and uh, is the group a tribe or what is the group. But you read this Wikipedia sort of thing on solidarity and you, you are hungry, sort of, what is this? Yeah? I mean, the definition is, say, flawed. Yeah? So, second ballot. So the third ballot is many things that you said, Wojciech. It's sort of now we look at what is solidarity in the common or in the current European context. And we see nothing, no such thing like solidarity. We didn't see German solidarity on the energy thing with the Eastern European countries, with the Gazprom sort of connection, and I can understand that the Polish are upset about that. We didn't see uh, Eastern European solidarity, not even French solidarity, with the refugee welcome politics of Germany, but we didn't see German solidarity with Italy when Italy did Mare Nostrum. So solidarity is not a legal concept, and the thing with solidarity is you can decide today you are a solidarian and the next day you decide you are not solidarian. In the refugee crisis, this was pretty much what Germany did. The first policies in 2012, when Italy had the problem, we would say Dublin II, very fine for us, no external border, uh, let them stay in Italy. And in 2015, three years later, when there was this Budapest issue with the train, Merkel turned from Saulus to Paulus, and here we go. And then Dublin II was basically um, uh, uh, wiped off. Yeah? So what is solidarity then if you cannot bring it into a legal concept and it then basically is a concept where power tops law? 
power tops law. And in many respects, it was the German power in the institutional setting of the European Union which could do the solidarity shift to the good side in the refugee crisis, but to the say, bad side in the Brexit crisis. I was really upset that we negotiated, or not negotiated, but that the discourse about all these Greek bailout papers were in the German newspapers about solidarity. Do we or not need to be solidarian with the Greeks? No. In a, in a currency union, what everybody knows, you need fiscal and social whatever entity, you need a legal frame, we could have benefited from a European unemployment scheme, we could have done a legal work in which the Greek then would not have been the beggars, depending on German solidarity, which you need to do a discourse about whether the Germans are, say, uh, nice to grant solidarity or they are not nice to grant solidarity. And I think that is the discrepancy that we are hanging around with this unclear concept of solidarity, which is not brought down into a legal concept and in which sometimes you're good the guy, sometimes you're the bad guy, um, but uh, you decide whether you are. Yeah. So now, fourth bullet, uh, or perhaps fifth and last. To bring this all together, sort of what is the concept of solidarity coming back to this, you know, French Revolution thing, liberté, égalité, fraternité. If, and that picks up what Marek has been saying, your question is, is the current legal context sufficient? I answer no, a clear no, and I gave you access of an answer in my last bullet, which is that it's not a clear definition, not a clear concept, it's not legally brought, brought down, and so it just doesn't help. We see that, yeah? But now, one step further, you may, and Marek always talked about the states who are solidarian, one to the other. Germany is solidarian with whatever uh, Poland on the gas or with the Greeks on the refugee crisis or with Italy on, on, on. But if you go back to what Jean Monnet said about Europe, nous ne coalisons pas des états, mais nous unissons des gens. Yeah? And then you read the writings of Hannah Arendt about what she called the political grammar of federalism. And basically she goes back to that integration is not about states and what states do, but about what, how you integrate, integrate or unisson des gens, how, how you integrate, how you unite people. And it's that uniting people thing, which is the fraternité. Huh? Egalité, liberté is more sort of the settings how the people are, but the fraternité, the solidarity concept, is about this uniting people. And so my offer for discussion is that we truly need to deconstruct the role of the state in the structures of the European Union if we want to make this function. And we could end up with all the people who have been thinking into this direction already in the last century, like Franz Marc, the famous painter, like uh, Albert Camus uh, in Esprit, who was also in, you know, in uh, basically with Hannah Arendt on the grammar of political sort of unir les gens and not the states, but you could also quote Denis de Rougemont, who's a Swiss author, who had all these concepts out there that you need to transcend the ethnic contours which are given by a nation state if you really want to unite people on the basis of solidarity. And that would bring us to really deconstruct the role of the nation state in the concept of the European Union if we want to be solidarian on the basis of people connections in the setting. And then you remind that basically this was it. I mean, nobody dares to say it today, but overcoming the nation state was and is the goal of the political integration project. And I think we should remind the wording of Jean Monnet, it's not about integrating states, it's about unite people. Well, I'm, I'm coming back to, to you uh, with with the question, with with set of questions that uh, Ulrike already posed, so I, I don't need to add much more on my side. But let me just say that you've been writing on on the crisis of the nation state as well in your recent book, proposing the other communities within Europe that are the basis of sort of European thinking, uh, uh, European integration in a way. Um. Uh, maybe let's start with this uh, last sentence um, uh, of um, Ulrike. Um, 
related to what uh, Monet uh, s said. Uh, I, I remember uh, he, um, that he sh sh should uh, um, um, have said that um, uh, if he could start the, 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 the whole process of the integration again, he would start not with economy but with the culture. Uh, I don't know whether he said it, but it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's nice and instructive, uh, I think, to what we are talking, uh, talking about. Because um, the problem with uh, solidarity, and uh, especially if you would like to base it on, uh, on those principles uh, um, related to the French Revolution, like uh, fraternity, um, the, the main problem with solidarity in uh, this, um, uh, in, in, in such a concept, uh, is the problem of uh, equality. Uh, solidarity, me mechanic, me in, in a sense of the mechanic solidarity, uh, automatic solidarity in that sense, is possible only if we are a, a community of equals. And this is the main problem. Uh, with Europe. We are not. We are not, uh, uh, and even on the level of the culture, we have different ways of living, of understanding the world, of understanding the reality. And this is uh, uh, very clear to, uh, to, 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 um, to, to, to be viewed, for example, uh, in a case of uh, of the differences between the north and the south countries uh, uh, in the euro crisis, this is not only about money. This is also about uh, a different uh, ways how to how to live. And I think in the migration crisis, this is the same problem that we don't have the same image of the world in the, of of our own world of of what Europe should be. And that is why I appeal not to intensify the unity because it can be counterproductive. You can not uh, product more s s um, solidarity by that, as it was the case in September 2015, where some countries tried to impose this automatic uh, form of solidarity in a case of uh, of the migration crisis on other countries, you can you can just uh, receive the, uh, the the reaction you you have received. In fact, uh, the deeper division uh, between the EU countries. So that is that is why I uh, um, rather appeal uh, not to intensify, rather to rebalance. We have to live with our differences in Europe, and you have to understand these differences. And, uh, um, you know, if you would like to make the revolution in Europe uh, to establish the uh, European Republic, um, uh, you have to uh, recognize that, for example, the French tradition is only one tradition we have in Europe. This is not the only one European tradition. So that is why, for example, Himmelfarb would uh, 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 argue that in, just in Europe we have different ways to modernity, and not only one. Mm. So this proposal can be uh, probably interesting for uh, f people in, f in, in France or maybe in Germany, but uh, a little bit less uh, for the people in the Central Europe, uh, not speaking about uh, Brits uh, who... Okay. Uh, well, but but uh, yeah. my, my <laughs> conclusion is, on the, uh, I would rather expect the Europe of republics, not the European uh, Republic. Okay. Um, first, um, Europe has a good... Um, 
sort of traditions in the positive meaning of revolutions, and one started right here across uh, the street. Second, we do have a problem of equality that's evident, and I think it doesn't need further discussion, especially in this room, that there is an income equality and all these in course Stieglitz and you know Piketty and so so yeah, we are beyond discussion, and uh, it's 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 the problem that we are not getting back to the cultural heritage of the French Revolution, which is ega liberté in the sense of Etienne Balibar, that liberty only comes along with equality, and this is basically the discussion which is when we are talking about the commons, which is what we are doing. How can we bring the concept of liberty together with equality in a more decent meaning in, in, in today? But here I go, and this is where I uh, was basically trying to uh, not get too much nervous. I am not against differences. That is not my point. What I am against is that we aggregate the differences in national contours. And there is not the Polish and the British and the French and the German opinion on Europe. What we see today, and that is basically my thesis here is, and we see it very clearly in the Brexit discussion, is we see two camps, which is an opening agenda and a closer agenda, the defenders or the protagonists of an opening agenda and of a closure agenda. So you could say what we are having is a new ba ba battlefield or ideological contest about um, the European humanism against the European naturalism, and it comes along on the European naturalism side with peace and with Orban and with UKIP and with Le Pen and with Hofer and whatever, uh, Pegida, and the opening agenda is the smart Erasmus Hughes, and part of it is sitting in, 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 in this room, and this is the European humanism in the sense of Franz Marc and uh, uh, basically... Uh, 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 Stefan Zweig and then all the others we had uh, um, in the 1920s and then the 1950s like uh, like Camus, like Hannah Arendt and so on and so forth. So I think what we need to, and then you come back to the notion of solidarity, right? Because when I say I don't want to avoid differences, but I want to avoid that we continuously shape the differences as if they were nationally given. They are not. I have much more in common with you all and most of the Poles who are the, uh, in, in whatever, Razem or Wojciech or uh, the, the people who hold against peace here than I have uh, uh, in common with German Pegida people, right? So, um, and this is, I think, the, 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 and we are not doing this for the first time in this 21st century. Hugo Victor Hugo and, 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 and Novalis did it in the, in the Deutsche Vormärz in the 19th century, and the people I quoted did it in the last century, and I think we need to do it now. Uh, and, and, and therefore, I am, uh, I'm, I'm really, um, in French I would say, uh, je suis militant, but in, in English it's probably not the right word. Um, so I am struggling or I'm fighting for that we learn the lesson in the 21st century that we need to deconstruct the ideologies which are framed by nation state and then given in nation state concepts and then we discuss the solidarity questions always along national contexts as if the Germans were not solidarian with the Greeks. There were many Germans who were solidarian with the Greeks. And who are the Greeks, by the way? And who are the Germans? Are the, is the Lidl, uh, uh, the women who works for Lidl, uh, the company went bankrupt, is she German or is Deutsche Bank people Lidl? You know, look at Brexit. What did Brexit to the, do to, the great, to Great Britain? They wanted to defend identity, British identity against the continent. And they wanted to sneak out of European solidarity. And what do they earn? They earn the implosion of their nation. If Theresa May today has one problem, then it's the unity of the British nation. And the only thing she has is the Scots there, and the youth there, and the city there. And what she needs to do is to invent a national discourse to unite a country which is perfectly ununited. And what she also needs to do, and this is nearly insane, is that the, she needs to go to The Guardian to write an article that now she asks the British artists to invent the British creativity. And then it drives me nuts, I'm sorry to say. So if we don't learn the lesson, the 21st century, that, that we go back to, again, Hannah Arendt's concept of integrated federalism, which is integrating people, or the, the concept of Albert Camus, which is that solidarity is the revolta that you do, even if you are not concerned by the abuse of your rights, but somebody else is, or the concept of uh, um, uh, uh, sort of unite, Jean Monnet, uniting people and not nations or not states, then I think we are missing for the third time in history the 
task which is given to Europe, which is just this, uniting people beyond nations. St still, thank you. Uh, st I, we'll, we'll be continuing discussion on the floor, but I encourage you also to raise your hands uh, to, to ask questions, give uh, comments. Uh, the question I, w which I see, and it is somehow resonating from Marek uh, remarks, is about the interest. Uh, you said the solidarity, as you would see it, is not to act against the interest or not to design <coughs> institutional framework or produce, I mean, come up with action that will go against interests of other partners then this, this is the solidarity. In a way, it resonates Jean Monnet, the, the, the framework of German-French partnership, to bring the interests so close that they are not going against each other. But then you just said that there is also the his or not his quote about the culture. Can, uh, can, can we also agree that apart from this interest-based solidarity, there is also the symbols of solidarity that Right now, Europe has perhaps a bigger problem with than with the real interest. Because what I would argue for, if I may argue for, as, a, as, a, as a moderator here, is that we're also creating problems by the language, by the use of language and by, 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 by uh, reinventing or applying culture to the problems where they were not so materialized. And in the sense of how we speak, how we did create narratives, you rightly pointed, we today create the narratives of disunity and anti-solidarity more than of solidarity of Europe. Uh, thank you for this question because, um, uh, yes, I think um, if uh, we are seriously uh, members of the same structure which the European Union is, it means that we, are, we should be at least obliged not to do something, not to undertake um, uh, actions uh, which in consequence uh, would uh, deteriorate the situation of our partners in the European Union. Um, in that sense, if for example, um, and this is the, uh, the, the practical uh, mean of, uh, of, of, of community, security community, community, political community, uh, if we are seriously uh, members of the same uh, uh, organization, of the same s s system, we shouldn't, we should avoid such an, uh, uh, such an actions, uh, um, which uh, uh, in consequence uh, uh, harm um, uh, our partners. So for example, we shouldn't uh, Mm, uh, invest in the military capabilities of third countries which can uh, uh, threaten uh, our uh, partners in the European Union, for, for example. Yes, uh, because uh, uh, the security of our partners uh, in the European Union should be a pr priority uh, if we are seriously in the same in the same uh, in the same system. But you are right, uh, saying that this is probably not enough. Uh, for having uh, the uh, European solidarity, we should have uh, a, a, at least the common ground of understanding of our cultural um, interdependence in, uh, in, in Europe. And that is, uh, this is the huge problem we have now, uh, that we don't uh, have, uh, as I said, the common image of what we understand to be Europeans, what make us Europeans in the globalized world, what is our European identity and our European values we are ready to fight for. Uh, not maybe uh, 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 to, uh, to sell these values to others as the magic solutions for other problems, but rather what, what makes us Europeans. And I think it is a problem not only because we started to be not uh, sure about it. it. This is not because uh, the enlargement, which of course adds some problems, uh, because now we have to define this common European heritage in a much more broader scope. Uh, uh, but uh, this is a problem for us because the world has changed or is changing dramatically. 
and the, 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 the post, let's say post-war liberal uh, world order is probably uh, uh, coming to its, uh, to its end. And we don't know exactly what will be the world of the future. And that might make us so confused to define our own uh, European identity in this uh, global, uh, global change. And I think this is probably uh, the most difficult challenge uh, in this uh, wider scope uh, of enlarged European Union, including different parts of our continents, the, the, the French uh, and German specificities, uh, uh, South countries, Central European countries, North European countries, uh, to, to take all this on board and to try to understand what makes us Europeans in the changing, uh, changing world. Without this, uh, I think I, I, I agree with you, this solidarity based only on the interests, where, again, I really believe the states play the, uh, um, the most important uh, role and will play. Uh, I can add then later why I, I believe in that. Uh, 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 without this, uh, uh, th this level of interest will be too less to, to, to create a real uh, solidarity in Europe. Okay, let me pick up on this European identity thing. And uh, I know that in European discussions it's very um, heavy to argue against this, you know, there's no such thing like European identity, we are all different and so, and the, it's also the, the, the fear that people have about this unity concept of Europe, there, you know, European identity, so. But I think the solution is that we need to differentiate between normative unity and cultural diversity. And that is what we always had in these you know, discussions. The discussions were also always the 40 years, 50 years of integration we have is we want unity in diversity. We want normative unity and cultural diversity. So everybody, you know, and, and then where does the cultural diversity come from? I'm German by passport, but I'm from Northern Westphalia. I take a plane, I go to Munich. Um, history books have told me that Munich and Bavaria belongs to Germany. I believe it because it's written there, but it's not my Heimat, it's not my identity, and, um, and this is it. So the, the, the difference is sort of what is the fiction about what is told to be your identity, which is a national sort of narrative, yeah? And what is your real identity, which much about more your, your soup, your language, your, you know, Borch and Poland and, and whatever. So, normative unity, cultural diversity, I think, gives, gives um, un piste, uh, in, you know, in, where, where we could find the solution what we defend. And if it's about what we defend as Europeans, then we defend the normative, the principles of normative unity, and those are, again, I come back to it, but the cultural heritage of the French Revolution, égalité, liberté, liberté, égalité, fraternité. But then, I think the task is, going back to what Marek said, the task is also that the solidarity thing does not only goes for us. It means solidarity with Aleppo. It means solidarity with, uh, uh, you know, with with Africa or the African women. It means solidarity with, uh, uh, you know, what I mean. Yeah. So it's the solidarity is always an open concept, and so it means that if we just stand on the cultural heritage, on the normative cultural heritage, not in the sense of identitarian identity, yeah, you understand me, but on the normative heritage of the French Revolution, I think everything falls from this. And what falls from this is that Europe, in terms of solidarity, could not go for a Frontex politics, because Frontex, Europe is never about closing borders. So basically the whole Frontex discourse is about violating the very heritage, the very cultural heritage of of Europe. And so if we take this for serious, what the cultural, what the French Revolution gives us in sense of solidarity, it would mean this. I know that the discrepancy of getting this into concrete politics is heavy. And especially in these days, because the agenda, this sort of the, the European humanism is so much challenged and so much under strain. And then also we need to transcend it into the age of digital democracy, which I think will be our task, that we assure that this 
this what I call European humanism, you know, under the conditions of surveillance and, and the whole business can be kept in, in the 21st century. But I think this is the agenda, and giving up on the agenda is not because the agenda is under challenge, but because the agenda is under challenge, we need to defend the agenda. Thank you. Before you continue the conversation, let's uh, have three comments that I noted from the floor, uh, starting from Rachel there. So I'd like your comments on whether you think identity politics is fracturing solidarity, so in the way that people are increasingly um, identifying themselves by smaller and smaller groups as I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a... And then the groups, what we've seen and what we're seeing is those groups closing themselves off. So, you know, for instance, in universities where people are saying, um, you know, only this type of person could be included in this discussion. Is that... Is identity politics um, fracturing our sense of a wider solidarity? Okay. We'll take two other uh, questions from the floor, then we come back, and I noted another one. Mm -hmm. A few points. Um, I think the very beginning of, of, of your statement, uh, Ulrike, the, uh, you said that there is a very, there's a lack of solidarity. I don't think that is true. Uh, there is enormous amounts of solidarity already institutionalized, already legalized, cast into legal frameworks within the European Union. I think we're forgetting that, and I think this is something we, we keep, have to keep in mind when we talk about solidarity within the European Union, that it is already, to a large extent, a union of solidarity, but then, of course, there are the individual, not yet uh, legal, legalized forms that make it difficult to, to handle. Um, <clears throat> I think also that we have uh, already some, some preconditions or basis laid for overcoming the nation state, and I think the most important for that is the European Parliament, where you do no longer di diversify be uh, this is from no, uh, this is from Sweden, and this is from, from Latvia, and this, this person is from Spain, but they are the conservatives, the socialists. There is a chance to overcome <clears throat> this, this nationalist uh, divisions that we're having in Europe. So I think uh, there, there the chance is uh, to, to really come also to a different form of governance in the commons. And I think this is the, the great problem that we are always facing when we talk about commons. What is the governance of commons? And certainly it couldn't be by the council and it, it's probably not ideal with the commission, but the parliament would be, uh, would be a great thing. Um, the, and, 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 and finally, um, I think um, the, Europe, uh, the United Kingdom has done us an enormous, ser possibly an enormous service by voting to get out of the Union. Because there we have the chance now of adopting English as the only official language of the European Union. We're not favoring any one member with it. And we have another thing that unites, uh, normatively unites us <laughs> if, if we would come to that. And maybe the last thing is we should elect a common European president. Again, this is something that would all people in the European Union would connect that. And we need these symbols of, of being all one, not div divided into nation states. I agree. Okay. Please, let's have a third comment now. Uh, I have an impression that there are uh, hidden assumption in, in both uh, uh, presentations, and I, I don't think that this is uh, the, the proof of any intellectual weakness, rather of the impossible situation we are in. I will start with Marek, with Marek, with Marek Cichotsky. Uh, he is saying there's a sort of minimalistic concept of, of solidarity, although I understand very well that uh, the concept of solidarity is not the best for such a vision, not to do the things which are detrimental to, to the partners. But politics on the level national or European, this is uh, politics of choice. When we are choosing, we are, we are always, uh, there is certain hierarchy. And this hierarchy also reflects the different interests, local. Uh, first, it means practically evacuation of any possibility of politics on the, on the level of European Union, and to have politics only on, on national level. And I think that this is the idea of, of Marek Cichowski. And then, uh, you, do, you didn't mention that uh, actually it was said that, that there are manifestations of, of solidarity for Rika, maybe it was difficult to say it, but massive transfer of resources, what is it if not the manifestation of, 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 of solidarity with a certain vision of 
equalization of the level of developments, utopian, but, but still, as a condition for possible integration, uh, really quite possible, uh, the dream of previous generation of federalization of Europe. Or you, you didn't mention those assumptions, which are quite clear in your reasoning. Now, Ulrika, with, <laughs> with, with, with you, um, I'm, I'm sharing on the level of values. It would be uh, very nice to have such a Europe. The problem is that, you, uh, that there is a contradiction, in, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say, in what you are saying, or uh, let's say certain dialectics, because you are saying that it should be solidarity of people. But people are not just individuals. They are politically organized in the nation states. And they are politically represented by their nation states. So you cannot avoid the discussion between representative of nation state to make such a decision because they are representing in a legitimate way. And we see that today only, only those governments have legitimacy now, popular. This is not good time for European Union. So there is a contradiction if you want to have solidarity of people. So there is assumption that we should have the beforehand already federal Europe. But how to arrive to federal Europe if you not have? So, the, the, so this, once again, in both cases, I, I don't think that this is weakness uh, intellectual. That there is, uh, those are quite clear to opposite choices in the situation where nobody knows how to go and w even where to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, I noted uh, four questions now from the floor for a second round, but I think uh, there, there is enough already for you to comment and to relate to each other, but please be brief at the same time, an impossible task. Uh, Ulrike? Okay, very quickly. So, uh, yes, I'm fully in favor of a European president that we elect, and I agree that we have already institutionalized, say, legal forms of solidarity in the in the current framework of the European Union, evidently because solidarity is also in the treaties. Um, I just uh, answer with Samuel Beckett, uh, try harder, fail better, try harder, you know. I mean, yeah, sure, uh, half full, half whatever, but we need to struggle hard to basically keep this alive in a moment where the European Council is taking over the momentum of who decides in the European Union. So now, um, I take this, uh, the question from Alex. Yes, you're right, but uh, it's the vicious circle we are in. I mean, Let's just, I mean, the thing is that the Maastricht Treaty, in the words of Rosan Vallon, Pierre Rosan Vallon said this in Warsaw on 6th of April last, this year. He said the European Union is built on a lie. And what is the lie? The lie is we are promised union of states and union of citizens. We are only union of states. And, the prop, and you see this very clearly in the Brexit thing is, if we were, theoretically speaking, union of citizens, then the UK as a country could leave the EU and the Brits would remain citizens of Europe. They don't. The moment the UK is to leave, then the Brits leave their cit European citizenship because the European citizenship is attached to the national citizenship. And this is the problem. So if we consider in the, in the you know, you read the Equal Liberty book of Balibar, if you consider that we had, we had a direct European citizenship, like basically alluded to in the Maastricht <coughs> treaties already, this is the, we need to try harder, try, fail better, yeah? You could imagine that the European citizenship, as European citizens, we are the sovereign of the political system of the EU, which we are not, because the Council, the European Council, and the states are representing and basically taking the decisions, which is why we are always coming back to this sort of the interaction of the states and the momentum of the state. I just think we need to deconstruct this, because if we were to take European citizenship as a goal for real, then we could imagine a political system in which we as European citizens are the sovereign and then we invent a political system which is beyond nation states, meaning clearly beyond a European Council that represents us in our function as state citizens, right? So this is the solution, not for now, not for tomorrow, but if we don't keep thinking in that direction, I do not know how we want to deconstruct the nation state business ever in the European Union and that's nothing that everything that Habermas writes up and down about hetera uh, you know, positioning of the states and the system and so on and so forth. We need to understand that in, you know, from Platon to Aristoteles to Rousseau to Kant, the citizens are the sovereigns of a system and we need to be as such in control of the system and not 
us represented by a nation state. So this is the uh, casus knactus, I would say, in Germany that I hope we can solve in the 21st century. Thank you. Mark, Mark Schiotzki. <coughs> um, yeah, thank you for all these comments. I, um, um, maybe uh, two, uh, two things, um, I hope briefly. Um, first of all, I, um, yes, I, ha I, I have a problem to understand this concept if I hear we have to deconstruct the, 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 the European Union and we have to do it to make it possible to, to unite people, to unite European people, yes? Because um, this construction we have, if I understand it correctly, this construct, institutional uh, construction of the European Union doesn't help uh, to, 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 to unite uh, uh, people in, uh, in Europe. And of course, my, my question is, what does it mean? Who should uh, then uh, unite uh, uh, European people? Um, uh, they uh, uh, by themselves, uh, just, uh, ju just, just so, and that, that, that is exactly my, my, my problem because I agree with uh, with uh, uh, Alexander Smola uh, uh, saying that uh, we have now in Europe the situation uh, where, on the other hand, probably the capacity of further integration is exhausted for a time being. I don't know for how long, but I take it as a fact that this capacity is exhausted. This is exhausted on the level of the European institutions you would like to deconstruct, and this is uh, exhausted on the level of societies. I think the majority of European societies are not in favor of uh, further uh, integration, and that should be taken as a fact. And uh, 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 the, 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 the representative democracies are now in Europe not only uh, the most important and dominating forms of political self-organization of the nations, which are legitimized, but they are probably the only one which are most reasonable forms of political organizations we have in, in Europe. And that it, why it is important? Uh, I think it's important because we enter a very complicated, a crucial historical moment in the development of our European civilization, which is linked to the whole um, Re digital revolution and the change in the political communication or in the change of the uh, public uh, communication and the forms of creating public opinion. And we observe it. Uh, take the campaign in, 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 in Britain, B Britain, which is uh, the best, to me, this is the best la laboratory what has happened. What has happened with the information and in, 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 with creation of uh, opinion and how this opinion is then changed and, 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 and offered for other people and what are the consequences of this revolution? To me, it's, it's a revolution like, uh, in, uh, if, if you like, in the, uh, in the 15th uh, century with Gutenberg revolution. What was the consequence of the Gutenberg revolution in Europe? You know? Uh, no, no, the war, the war in Europe, and the chaos, in fact, which was uh, 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 um, uh, which was solved Can you by, yeah. by, by, by by organizing the modern states as the solution for this situation. Yes, so I think if you take, if, if, I, I like this approach really. I I I I I, I really did. I don't agree with, with Smola uh, in this respect uh, uh, that he says that uh, my, my, my option is only uh, nation state. No, I, I, I really believe we need the European civil society. We really need it. But uh, in, at this stage of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the changes we have uh, in, uh, in the world, and facing all these consequences uh, of the digital revolution and the change if the, in, in the circulation of information and the formation of the public opinion. 
we cannot just rely on the concept that uh, the people will, will unite themselves from the bottom uh, up uh, uh, approach. It, to my uh, understanding, it's a very dangerous approach. It's, it, at least it ignores the consequences of the, of, the, of the revolution we can observe in, uh, in, in the public space in, uh, in Europe. And this is not about only about populism, this is about the way how we create the opinion. And you ask about the small groups uh, and small uh, identities of small groups. What, what we can observe is uh, the creation of information bubbles in, in our societies. The parallel identities which don't communicate with each other. Yes? And this is a real problem and I think uh, we cannot solve this problem without uh, such a uh, structure as uh, uh, modified it, but uh, uh, still uh, 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 state structures. Thank you very much. I think uh, in the in the second round and closing round uh, of questions and comments, you everybody will deserve an explanation how Gutenberg uh, uh, revolution brought <coughs> wars to Europe a little bit, especially if you're com having your comments saying that the, the public opinion bubbles are the problem. I have to inform you that Eurozine is one of these serious attempts, to a certain extent, influential. Um, in, in overcoming the bubbles for the, for the project of, of, of having the exchange between them, between the national discourses, national public opinions and national languages to make a European uh, 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 community come together. Uh, there are four questions I noted. Uh, we start with uh, uh, yeah, the one in the back and then... I, I have a microphone. Does that mean yes, that please. I have the word? Yes, <laughs> please. Okay, so my name is uh, Anne Ige and I come from Sweden, uh, from a cultural journal, but also for a center of European studies. So I've been very interested in listening to your talk here. Um, I was thinking about this um, European identity and solidarity, and I'm thinking that if we go back to the 1950s, we see how the first Western European countries that started this integration process sort of had their cooperation as their main point in common. But after this enlargement process, um, it seems, and where the EU dominates the European so much more than in 1950, it seems as European, the Europeaners have come more in the center of, of what's under scrutiny. And that's interesting, but it's obviously also problematic. It triggers the search for the other, it may be Islam, but it may also be this nation state that you were talking about. Um, and um, because, so I think that is sort of problematic, but I'm still very um, interested by what you say about how to deconstruct the role of the nation state. And there was a, a question about the European Parliament. I think that we still have, it's very nationally defined I vote, if I vote in the, the elections, I vote for a Swedish party. So my question goes to Ulrike Gero, and the question is, do you think we sh there should be European parties for real, not only as cooperation happening? That's my direct question. Mm -hmm. Second question there. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, if we take as, a, uh, as an example uh, the migrant or slash refugee crisis, it becomes apparent that if uh, there was any uh, tool that was able to kind of a challenge to ease the tensions around it, at least for a while, this is the nation state. Uh, and if this is the question, I notice that our debate so far goes into <clears throat> this realm of uh, uh, um, emphasizing the universalist nature of solidarity. So my question is of a, of a practical nature. What are uh, the natural limits of solidarity? You have mentioned, Ulrike, that uh, we need to be also solidar with Aleppo, with, uh, with the African woman. But my question is, uh, does our universalist notion of solidarity have certain limits and how that overlaps with the frontiers of European integration? Where we should where we should define what solidarity practically means. Where, where is that stop? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, the third question here from... Uh, 
Ulrike, you won my heart and my mind, and I think you won the heart of Marek Tchaikovsky too. But my question is, until when do you think that you will win the hearts and minds of those who nowadays feel betrayed by us, by European elites planning this republic and voting for peace, AfD, Fidesz, Front National, Flams Balang, UKIP, because they think that Europe is a system which transfers solidarity to the top of the society. They feel betrayed because it's not about redistributing solidarity towards them, but towards those who already have everything. And how will the founding moment, you mentioned Hannah Arendt and the American Revolution, which we should not forget, the American Revolution, it's not only about French Revolution, then how this founding moment will be organized when we European citizens and all European citizens, not only the elites, will vote or gather or something like that on a European marketplace to vote for this new republic. Thank you very much. Now the fourth and closing uh, Yeah, I have two question. very two small remarks. Uh, the first one is to uh, Ulrike Gero. I'm a French speaking from Brussels, uh, which was educated in Dutch. So, uh, and you know, Belgium is a kind of mini Europe with a lot of problems. My first remark is about uh, the, uh, that she quoted the French Revolution, and she opposite the normative identity and the ethnic identity. And I always wonder if uh, there is not in France, uh, behind the normative identity of the French Revolution, a hidden ethnic identity. Uh, you know there is a say that the political project of France is to make universalism in one country. Uh, that's the first remark. The second one, uh, maybe you told about it, but I didn't hear it. Uh, there is a huge social factor in what is happening in Europe and uh, what uh, the, the people who are voting. When you see the uh, sociology of the last election in the United Kingdom, in Austria, in Poland, you see that the people who are voting for the populist, so-called populist parties, are people from the small towns, from the labor, etc. And you, you did not speak about that factor, if I am correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, now perhaps we can start with you, Marek uh, Cihotsky. To, to you, you, you are right, we didn't. And uh, um, we didn't talk about this uh, social aspects of, uh, of, uh, of, of solidarity. Uh, because, um, 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 again, I think uh, uh, probably in this case you can see it very clearly uh, that uh, the mode of the European integration is uh, at this stage uh, exhausted, that the European Union is not perceived as the solution of the, of the redistribution problems. It was a a big promise, uh, especially for the countries of this region, of the modernization. But then uh, it was uh, really realized that uh, 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 the redistribution, uh, redistribution of the outcomes, of the effects of this modernization is not, uh, uh, not uh, 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 fair. And uh, I think uh, uh, this is a, a very important part of the of the of the uh, of the lacking uh, uh, reliance on uh, European Union and, and, and a shrinking trust on European integration in the European societies that it is not perceived as the solution of this problem. Uh, it is rather uh, perceived as. Um, as the, uh, uh, as, as, as the institution representing the interests of the small group of, uh, of, of those who are already uh, um, uh, um, let's say uh, uh, they, 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 uh, they are uh, um, uh, comfortable and they, they, they are, they are uh, uh, um, the benefiters of, uh, of this, uh, of this in, in integration. So, uh, and this gives, of course, the right, uh, right for, for, uh, for the populist uh, parties. Uh, so, um, you are, uh, of course, right. And, and, and the second point uh, 
I would like to uh, uh, take is the this limits of the universal um, approach to uh, solidarity. I think um, uh, I see uh, at least two uh, important. Uh, uh, the first one, you cannot uh, uh, extend this uh, universalistic expectations uh, uh, towards solidarity uh, if uh, uh, your activities harm yourself or your partners and this is uh, th that was exactly the problem with the with the migration uh, crisis and uh, secondly i think uh, uh, solidarity in this universalistic european approach uh, cannot mean uh, that we uh, take from um, other uh, parts of uh, of the world the responsibility. Uh, this is not the solution. Uh, if we uh, take from uh, this uh, uh, societies uh, from other parts of uh, of of the world, their own responsibility for their own uh, development. Well, Ulrike. Okay, so the four questions. I start with the uh, um, the Parliament. The, like obviously, obviously. I mean, and this is not a new debate. We are discussing transnational parties since basically the last decade, if not the last twenty years. And I would go even further. By the way, this is really con getting very concrete. I don't know whether you were informed about European alternatives. You know, there's a concrete uh, reflection ongoing uh, whether they do um, a European party with the same name in all countries and so on and so forth. So. We can only hope that for 29 we are better off and we are organizing this. Uh, the next points to struggle for, or to fight for, would obviously be voting equality, that we have the same sort of producing of lists and, and you know, that we just have voting equality so that we can come closer to a European competition on, 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 on political. By the way, I don't know whether you looked up in, you know, the, you, you followed a little bit what the so-called identitarians are doing, yeah? But they just had a meeting in, in Linz in Austria a week back they are doing this yeah they are going to organize the european identitarian party and the problem of us being on the other side of the river which is european humanism against european naturalism is that they are better organized they get the money from putin okay i know so they have that advantage but the left is also in this sort of vanity contest who has the better paper and who has the better concept and we are struggling like you know the left is always split in these uh, uh, situations and therefore this you know google the Linz meeting of the european European identitarian movement, uh, with a little bit of cynicism, we could argue that they are going to build the best European mov movement because they have an idea of what Europe should be, and they call them, they entitle the conference um, uh, Die Verteidigung Europas, the defense of Europe. Whereas there's no sort of unitarian, sort of lefty, progressive concept of what Europe is. We struggle against the capitalist uh, thing. You read the blog of Frédéric Lordon in France and, you know, everybody has its left, so to say. And while we are struggling about what the left should be and think about Europe, they are organizing Europe. Yeah, that's my biggest fear for the 2019 elections. The second question was, uh, where should solidarity stop? Um, yes, I know. I mean, but this is the, the, the very... Th thinking of basically the solidarity in one sentence does not stop unless every man is equal in the world. So if we take the concept of Kant and eternal peace and who deconstructed the nation state already in 1792, uh, so we are three, 300 years behind, behind what, what Kant wanted, but no. The, the, I, the, the, the problem is not that solidarity should stop and that the discourse should be that it stops. The, the political discourse will always be that the solidarity cannot be because we don't have the money, we don't pay for this, whether on climate protection or all these solidarity battles where we do and where the Europeans are still on the privilege using side with respect to many other people on the globe and this is the post-colonial discussion. So the discourse cannot be uh, our solidarity will stop there and there. there's no border of solidarity unless ultimately in I don't know which world we are all united and everybody is in eternal peace and everybody is equal. But the, the only difference we do is from that concept, which is the utopian concept, to bring it down into real politics and to struggle very hard on each and every step that on Aleppo today, on the women in Africa tomorrow, on whatever is Sudan, you see my point, yeah? It's just bridging the gap between the utopian goal and what we strive for in, in, in real politics. The third question, thank you, Volker, better could have not thought about a question, but 
I think it goes straight into the problem and by the way to what Marek said. Yes, if we defend or I defend this European Republic based on, you know, Hannah Arendt's political grammar, on, and there is a central point here, which is that Hannah Arendt distinguishes between freedom and sovereignty. It's very interesting. And then he, she says that ultimately nation states are hijacking sovereignty to misuse it and to steal freedom from people. That is a very interesting intellectual thought, which I think we get wrong in many of our current European discussions where we always pretend there's so, such, such thing like a sovereign nation state who we need to, you know, to defend. So bringing this back to um, of what Marek said. Marek says the agenda is not defendable because the system is exhausted and the people are exhausted. Yes, I agree, the system is exhausted. This EU system is exhausted. Are the people exhausted? I don't know. The, I think most people are exhausted from the EU, but many are not yet exhausted from Europe. What I can detect is that we never had as vibrant discussions about Europe than today. By the way, the identitarians in Linz have the same discussions, but we are sitting here, we are defending the European humanitarian agenda, and if you go into all this NGO net world, I think you look at the youth and what the young people are doing, I never sensed in my personal life such a vibrant discussion on Europe and the goals of Europe in the past two or three years because civil society, especially the youngsters, which are not even in this room because nobody here is below 30, um, uh, are really, really active because they have understood that what we defend is just not only our money and security, which is the least side to defend, but our value system in the sense of the European Revolution. So, um, the French uh, Egalité, Liberté. So, here you go. I can understand that most citizens like those who go for UKIP, um, uh, Wilders, the whole battery, um, are reproaching to us that we did this elite project and that we basically steal their money. In a way, they are right. We produced a system which led to much of economic centralization and in which those who are living in the rural areas are now the modernization and globalization losers. I agree. So what? I think we just need to think better and to produce a system in which we take them with us and in which the globalization and modernization losers are not forgotten in the European project. I still think that this battle can be won if we frame our project correctly and that we don't frame it la classe politique and the losers, but we frame it citizen-based, which is the citizen, European citizenship talk that I'm trying to do and which is to understand that res public in the sense of Cicero is to unite for the common good. And I think that this reframing of a discourse that we shift the system actually from nation states which have been hijacking our interest and especially the interest of the globalization losers. And we tell them, look, now we shift the system to we are the sovereign of the systems, we offer European citizenship and I can explain to you that you in that system will have a say and you are better off because whatever it is, nationalism is not the solution. I actually think that this discussion can be won and it can be won, what I would say in Germany, in der Fläche, if we would dare to reframe our own approach. Th thank you very much. There are, this, con this debate could, should, and most probably will continue in many other directions, but we exploited our time beyond the, beyond the, the limits. Uh, ten, ten minutes past, I think you can excuse us. We have to stop now. Uh, lots of questions still to be addressed. Just want to, to, to remind you that apart from the, the area we defined uh, in this debate, there is uh, one thing that is predominant in the European perception of problems they, they live in. The recent uh, surveys report that people fear mostly terrorism, security, uh, and, and the issues that are much further beyond economy and, and uh, where actually so far nation states are actually the, the, on the delivery um, side of, of security and uh, also respond to these 
Just, just one sentence, I apologize, but I, 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 I truly think we are really trapped in this security discourse. We need to remind yeah. Hannah Arendt that politics is about securing freedom and only freedom, and you can be very secure in a prism. And the more, and, and former GDR people were actually very secure too, they just were missing freedom. So the yeah. problem is that we really need to go against this security discourse because this is the perversion of the European humanism. Couldn't agree more.